Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Mass General Transplant Center update on COVID-19 and transplantation. Um, we're going to cover a, an array of topics. Um, much of it was informed by your questions that you submitted um, during registration. And we do have some, some folks from the Transplant Center and ID departments here to talk with us. Dr. Cotton, do you mind going to the agenda slide, please? All right, so just so you guys know, you can submit your questions through the Q&A functionality, but much of the slides, like I mentioned, um, have been informed by your questions beforehand. So we're hoping that it'll answer most of your questions, but please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A functionality. And then let's get some introductions underway. Um, Dr. Cotton, if you could lead. Sure. So I'm Camille Nelson Cotton, and I'm the Clinical Director of Transplant and Immunocompromised Host Infectious Diseases at Mass General. And I've um, met many of you over the years. Happy to be here today. Thank you, Dr. Cotton. I have Dr. Lewis next to my screen. Okay. Thanks, Stacy. Uh, Greg Lewis, I'm the Medical Director of the Heart Transplant Program, and I'm happy to be here with my colleagues from the Transplant Center uh, and all of you this evening. Thank you, and Dr. Bethea. Thanks, Stacy. I'm Dr. Bethea, the medical director of the liver transplant program. And again, very happy to be on this webinar with all of you. Look forward to talking. Thank you, Dr. Riala. I am Leo Riala. I'm the medical director of the kidney transplant program. And thanks, uh, Stacy, for putting this together. And, and for Camille, for Dr. Cotton, who is an expert in infectious disease, has been kind of guiding us through uh, all the COVID uh, pandemic and hopefully, uh, sharing with us some, some uh, next steps uh, and updates. Thank you. Dr. Keller? Yes, hi, I'm Brian Keller. Uh, I'm the newest member of the team. Um, I will be coming into uh, Boston to MGH uh, here in the next few weeks. Um, be joining the lung transplant team as the incoming medical director. I look forward to participating and getting to meet and uh, know everyone. Welcome, Dr. Keller. And last but not least, Dr. Elias. Thank you, Stacy, And welcome everyone to our webinar. I'm Nahil Elias. I'm the Surgical Director of the Kidney Program, also the Quality Director for the Transplant Center. And welcome to all of you. And thanks to a great team for putting all this together. And I'm Stacy Jean-Claude, the Outreach Program Manager for the Transplant Team and welcome everyone. So we're gonna talk about vaccines and boosters, therapies and treatments and travel, masking, social activities, et cetera. All right, I will hand the mic over to Dr. Cotton. Great, thanks very much, Stacy. Um, so as we're getting started, we're gonna do a couple of polls. Um, so Stacy, you're gonna trigger the, the polls. So hopefully everyone can answer these. Um, so the first one is you are what type of transplant recipient or uh, NA if you're not a transplant um, patient or recipient. And then the second question here is how many COVID vaccine doses have you received in total? And so we don't mean like just either boosters or whatever, just the total number of vaccines you have received zero to two, three, four, or five. I'm gonna give you guys five more seconds and then I'm gonna end the poll and we'll see the results. Great, so the majority of people, 53% um, are kidney recipients, 14% uh, hearts, 11% livers, 11% lungs, and then 12% NA. Um, so that's uh, great. That's kind of what national numbers look like. So it's a good slice of the um, national population as far as the numbers. And then uh, most people have received four doses of vaccine, 68%, um, 16% have had five doses. And that's great because that's sort of the maximum for where we are right now, but those people are fully, fully vaccinated. 13% have had three and 3% have had zero to two. Um, so great, great, well, thanks. That, that helps um, frame the discussions. Um, so where are we now? And um, 
here is the current scheme for vaccinations and boosters for transplant patients. So um, for uh, people over the age of 12, and I'm assuming that most people on this call are adults. So either over the age of 12 or over the age of 18, whether it's Pfizer or Moderna, people at this point should have had three doses as their primary series, and then a booster at least three months later, and now another second booster four months after that first booster. Okay, so it should be, I call it the three plus one plus one, where it's three doses of the primary series, one booster, and then another booster for at least four months later. For those people that got the Janssen uh, or J&J &J vaccine, it's um, basically four doses with uh, two as the primary series plus a booster after two months and another booster after four months. All of this is available from the CDC and it also came out in that um, message that you got on Gateway within the past several days. So everybody hopefully is heading into five vaccines or has had five vaccines. There's been some discussion that when people go to pharmacies that they are not able to get the vaccines that are needed. And I will say that as long as you click off immunocompromised, you should be able to get these vaccines. The CDC has said that people can self-attest, like you can just state that you are immunocompromised, moderately or severely immunocompromised. Certainly organ transplant patients always um, qualify uh, and that vaccinators should not deny vaccination to a person due to lack of documentation. So you don't actually need to document and these should be widely available at this point. Now, in addition to vaccines, and you know, I will say that there's a lot of great safety data on vaccines and we're feeling really comfortable with vaccination at this point. And we know that vaccines have really saved hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives at this point. Immunocompromised people are less likely to respond to vaccination. So at this point, we do have a recommendation that immunocompromised patients get both vaccine, plus there's a monoclonal antibody called Evusheld um, that can provide better coverage, especially for um, high-risk patients. And so it's basically it's a, two different ways of providing protection. One is through vaccinations, again, a little less protective in transplant patients, plus this monoclonal antibody, which is an injection um, that we, uh, we and many other places are giving. Um, and uh, just this week, Dr. Riella and his group had safety and efficacy data in um, transplant recipients showing really um, good outcomes as far as safety and then that it's effective uh, to use this monoclonal antibody. The monoclonal um, antibody has been uh, a little hard to come by um, the rollout. Um, we need to do injections and observe for an hour afterwards. So there, um, it's been a little slower than um, nationally than we would have liked. But I think at this point we're, we're doing a pretty good job there are a lot of questions on antibody therapy versus vaccines. So Evusheld is the antibody therapy, and these are proteins that uh, mimic or improve the body's natural immune response. Um, and they do act like our own antibodies to basically identify and attack a specific disease-causing organism. And unlike vaccines, they work almost as soon as they are administered. So they're different. Um, vaccines stimulate the body's immune system, and it can take several weeks to have a response to vaccines. So it takes a while to kick in. Um, and I, in this context, they are being used to prevent infection. It gets a little confusing because one of the treatment options is a different monoclonal antibody. So that's what we're using when people are um, sick. For now, we only have FDA approval for a single dose of 300 milligrams of each type of antibody. And we think that the FDA may be updating guidance that we could give another dose six months after the first dose, but I think we're waiting to hear what happens with the pandemic, what the variant strains are, looking at safety and efficacy. And sometime soon the FDA may say, go ahead and give a second dose. But so far we don't have any recommendation to give a second dose because we're operating under the emergency use authorization, it does um, 
we have to be careful and make sure that we are going by the emergency use authorization. Um, those are rules that we need to follow very closely during this time. Regarding access to Evusheld, um, so for primary care doctors can do it through an in-network um, referral. And then external referrals um, are um, either Gotham's in the state of Massachusetts has an amazing program. I sent the paperwork in today. They book lickety split, it's wonderful. There's some other um, programs, uh, as you can see, listed here. And then if you're out of, out of outside of Massachusetts, you probably want to check on your own state program um, and see how you could get it through those resources. Um, and then uh, you can scan either of these, um, either of those and to get more, more resources if you need. But, and anybody can put a prescription into Gotham's. It could be your primary care doctor, any number of people, and the paperwork's super quick. There were a bunch of questions that we got about antibody and cellular testing for response to vaccination or response to measuring Evusheld. These are still not recommended. And the CDC has said that the utility of serologic testing or antibody testing, cellular immune testing, or B cell quantification to assess immune response to vaccination and guide clinical care has not been established. And they are not recommending this testing um, outside of research studies at this time. And so the background there is we don't really know what level of antibody is protective or what level of cellular immune response is protective. And um, uh, so we um, can't uh, tell you what is safe. Um, so it's really important. I, I've seen some dangerous situations where people have checked their antibodies and then they like take off their mask and go to parties and stuff like that's really never recommended. Um, and it's important that we give vaccines and protective antibodies as recommended, not based on antibody um, levels. Um, some of you may be confused because we have measured some antibody levels when we initially had very limited supplies of Evusheld. And so we were just doing that to give it to people who were antibody totally negative, so they got priority. But at this point, we don't need to be doing that any longer. And unfortunately, and I know many of us on this call would really love to have either an antibody result or a cellular immune testing result that would tell us we are fully protected, you're good, go ahead, you know, go, go to the concert, go do whatever it is you wanna do and you'll be totally protected. And that's definitely not available at this time. And I suspect it actually won't really be available. We very rarely speak like that in the immunology and infectious disease world. So let's do another poll question. Um, Stacy can put up the poll, but what precautionary measures, measures do you currently follow? Are you doing masking, hand hygiene, avoiding crowds, or all of the above. And why don't you go ahead and vote? Maybe a couple more seconds and then Stacy can put up the answers for us. Great, 84% of you are doing all of the above. So that's, um, that's great, that's great. I, I do think at this point in the pandemic, we still need to be doing all, all of those things. So really important to be wearing good masks. I think many of you are doing a great job with this. I'm seeing some awesome masks when I see people in clinic, people are double masking, they're wearing, um, Excellent, excellent masks at this point. Um, we've learned what masks are comfortable for our individual uh, faces. And um, you can see like on this, um, a well-fitted mask, you know, when they're knotting the ear loops and whatnot, they're doing a great job. Um, and so that's, that's really good. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the best, best masks are the N95 or the KN95. Um, those are certainly the best. And we really see virtually no transmission when these are worn all the time. So most of us were quite nervous working in the hospital in the very beginning of the pandemic. And at this point, I think we're all incredibly comfortable wearing these really good masks. Um, disposable masks are still pretty good. I double mask and that I think enhances things a bit. It feels a little tighter. 
cloth mask we wouldn't really recommend at this point because they're really um, not so not so good. So that's been shown. What about treatment of COVID and transplanted patients? So um, if you do uh, test positive, we would generally recommend that most transplant patients be treated with either intravenous uh, remdesivir. You can see intravenous because it's a there's the syringe, and an alternative would be monoclonal antibody with bevtolizumab, um, um, which is a one-time infusion. Many of you have probably heard about uh, Paxlovid, but there are significant drug interactions with immunosuppressive medications, including tacrolimus, cyclosporin, and everolimus. So we don't use this if people are on those therapies because we can't check drug, drug levels when people are testing positive because basically we, it's very hard to get them into a laboratory for blood testing, so it's not really safe. Um, we do recommend that if you are, so in general, if you have symptoms and you're worried you have COVID, you can certainly do a rapid test at home. If it's positive, you take that as a true positive. However, if it's negative, I definitely recommend that you uh, get a PCR test done as soon as possible so that we have rapid test results and then we can treat you as early as possible. And then if you have a positive test, we want you to call your primary care doctor, but also call your transplant clinic. And all the transplant clinicians on this call have said that they really want you to call transplant clinics so we can talk about your best treatments, how we're going to manage your immune suppression, um, what it means for you as an individual. And we really want to be an active part of that process. And then just to finish, so what is safe at this point? So at this point in the pandemic, um, we still recommend for restaurants, eating outdoors, it's summertime. Um, there are still very high rates of transmission in the New England area. We would recommend eating outdoors, keeping your mask on. If it's crowded outdoors, you know, try to sit at a table far away. Um, but definitely outdoor dining is good. At this point, it's very hard to recommend shows, although if you really want to go to a specific show and if you can keep an N95 on the whole entire time without taking it off to eat or drink or any of that, if you can keep an N95 properly on the whole time, it's certainly reasonable to consider shows. Travel is tough. Um, right now, uh, if you travel abroad, if you are, testing positive, I don't know where this beautiful waterfall is, but if it's in a part of the world where they might not be readily able, able to take care of transplant patients, and if you do get really sick, that could be very challenging. Also, if you test positive and you're abroad, you can't come back to the United States for a certain period of time. We're the, uh, one of the only countries that doesn't allow travel of positive people back to the US. Um, so at this point, we would be very cautious about travel. If you're traveling within the United States, you'd want to have a plan um, to be careful about where you're staying, where you're eating, the activities you're doing. Um, but most places in the U.S. have a transplant program relatively nearby. So perhaps it's a you know, time that you would consider domestic travel or travel to Canada, but maybe not travel far away. Um, Yes, and if you are traveling, if you do decide to go abroad, I would definitely make sure that all your vaccines are up to date and hopefully you get some Evisheld before you travel. These are some links which are predominantly uh, the links that many of us in the medical world are using, but we can certainly put those into the chat and give you access to those. Um, and they are kept very up to date. And that's it. So um, at this point, we are happy to start the uh, question and answer. And um, I don't know if which of my colleagues would like to uh, get started. Thanks, Camille. I may start with uh, a few questions that I, I heard here on the Q&A that may be interesting. So one is about Evushel and its uh, protection against some of the new variants uh, of, uh, of SARS-CoV-2 and if there's any data out there for people to, to know about. Yes, that's a very cutting edge question. Um, we are concerned that with BA4 and BA5, which we don't have in high number yet in the United States, but that Evusheld may be much less protective uh, against those, but that's we're waiting on more data on, on that topic, but that's a really important one. So Evusheld may work for a while. So if you're timing something, like if you really feel like 
you need to go on a trip or if you need to do something, it might be actually a moment of opportunity. We've seen all these ebbs and flows during the pandemic. And right now, before we have a lot of, you know, the next variant, um, it might be a good time to take the opportunity to do something uh, cautiously, but with Evusheld and a lot of vaccines on board. Thank you, Dr. Cotton. May I, may I bring Dr. Lewis for the discussion? There were questions about Evusheld and some of the side effects uh, that were reported. Um, including the, involving the heart. Can you comment a little bit on that? Sure. Uh, thanks, Leo. So the ProVent trial uh, enrolled over 5,000 patients and looked at all adverse events. And the, the adverse event rates are actually very similar in those that received Evasheld and those that received placebo. Uh, so the concern about cardiac side effects, there was uh, one myocardial infarction or heart attack uh, in the Evasheld group um, in the trial that had a two to one randomization. So more patients got Evasheld than got the placebo um, and there were zero in the placebo group. So I think that there were some early concerns raised about the possibility of myocardial infarction. But if you look at the, the numbers, you know, the adverse event rates were very low um, with Evasheld. Uh, in the largest trial that was done to date. And again, the overall adverse event rates were no different between the two groups. Ryan, do you want to coordinate the next question? Yeah, so let's see. Um, see a question here about um, kind of real world, real world experience of long flights uh, and traveling um, while you're masked, but while others on the flight may not be masked. Um, I think there have been quite a few studies looking at um, air handling on, on airplanes and because of the way the air flow works from blowing from the top from the ceiling down to the floor, um, it does provide some, some protection and, and air circulation as well as filtration. Um, I think there's, not, there's always going to be some risk uh, as long as there are unmasked passengers and, and we do know that um, masking works best when everyone is masked and um, each each step, you know, every time someone is wearing a mask, there's a little bit more protection. But um, but I think um, the flights uh, are, have good circulation in, in terms of their airflow and um, seem to be as safe as as can be in terms of forms modes of travel in, in the current situation. I can jump in too. I see a few more questions following up on, on Evusheld. One's a two-part question um, about weight limits. Uh, there's currently sort of a, a weight limit around uh, someone here is sort of shy by a few pounds of it, asking if it's still safe. And then also noting, which I think applies to some of multiple questions, having a reaction to one of the vaccines. Um, and you know, in that case, would we recommend Evusheld or something alternative? I think for the latter part, what I would say is, you know, oftentimes when we talk about the vaccines, if there has been a reaction to one, it's often still safe to consider some of the other ones. Camille, I'll let you sort of weigh in, but it looks like this person had a reaction to the Moderna. Um, as it comes to Evusheld, there have been, you know, some patients who have had it under the weight limit without reactions, but I don't know, Camille or anyone else here, if they'd have other discussions on it. I'd recommend you wear heavy shoes and get, <laughs> get weighed in clinic. And um, I, yeah, I, I would, I don't, technically you're supposed to abide by the emergency use authorization, but um, I don't think that medically there would be a problem if someone's slightly under the weight limit. It's not intended for ch like small children, but um, I would, I don't think that that's medically concerning. Um, there are questions about trending antibody levels after every shelled. And again, that's really not um, recommended. And I think it just enhances anxiety and it's not clear that it is recommended or that we know what to do with it. Um, so I hope that helps. I would just get your Evusheld, get all your vaccines. We do strongly recommend vaccines 
if you have to pick one or the other, I would definitely always go with vaccine for better general protection, but then also try to get um, the Evusheld in addition to like, it's a kind of a two different approaches. Who's up next for a question? Um, somebody's asking if there are any long-term effects of taking Paxlovid. Um, uh, and we don't think so, that there are any long-term effects. We are very comfortable with one of the drugs that's in Paxlovid, it's a combination. And we have had decades of experience with ritonavir and we think that that is quite safe. But again, we don't recommend Paxlovid for transplant recipients if they're on tacrolimus or um, cyclosporin or um, everolimus or serolimus because of drug interactions. Who's up next for a question? There are some questions about uh, the risk of COVID infection to trigger rejection. And so this, this is, you know, I think an interesting kind of topic and it has two components. We know that infections uh, may activate your immune system and, and, and just because of the whole activation of the immune system could precipitate rejection. And the second part is that whenever you have an infection, a very severe infection, uh, there might be some reduction or adjustments on your, your immune suppression and, and that can sometimes make the immune system more active. But despite all that, when we review all our, our, our data of patients that have developed COVID, at least in the short term, we have not seen a, a higher rates uh, of, uh, of rejection. So I think the, the immune suppression adjustment is something that you have to do with your own provider. Uh, so whenever you get, if you get COVID, by chance you have to contact your transplant center and, and talk to your provider. And of course they will look into individual cases and decide on the best approach and it's a balance. And uh, for each one, this balance may be different. Uh, but it, it is definitely something that uh, we are, we're very careful and we take that into account whenever we're doing adjustments. Camille, there's a question about these differences between different types of masks and what, why is uh, uh, KF or K, uh, K95 and all these different subtypes of, uh, of masks I don't see the question. Sorry, there are a lot of questions, folks. <laughs> um, and I see a question. I do see, I don't see that question. Um, it's more, I think more about, you know, is it worth, you know, getting one of these different masks versus a mask that kind of fits you well and protects it? And I know that some of them are uncomfortable. Like if you're going for a long time, it, you know, especially with some of the very tight ones, it's really hard to keep them. Uh, and so where is where the balance kind of lies into those? Yeah, so I find it really hard to wear um, an N95 for a long time. And I think all of us um, healthcare providers would be uh, quite familiar with that. But, you know, now I have this N95 that's a duck bill and I... It's not very fashionable. I think I'm, I think Dr. Bethea is laughing at me, but um, I can wear it all day, and I wear it <laughs> wear it to round. I think we all find what's good on our face, but I think for most of us at this point, we just want to prevent COVID. So it's whatever you know. I would try several different types, but certainly N95 is the highest level, um, and then the uh, KN it's KN94, right? Is the like next, and that's really comfortable to wear. And then after that, it kind of goes down to these surgical masks. I don't know, Leo, if there's something more in that question or if anybody else, um, maybe Brian, because he's a pulmonologist, so he's attached to those lungs. Yeah, absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. The, the N95s provide the greatest protection and it has to do with the, the pore size of the mask. And, and as you go down in efficacy, you're essentially getting masks with larger pore sizes. Uh, so the KN94s are not quite as good, but they're they're still better. Surgical masks are good. Cloth masks have the biggest pore size to so allow the most um, particles through it. Um, I think I would also point out too, the CDC website has a list because you can go online and buy these KN94 masks, but um, with anything where there's been an explosion of 
pop of demand, you get some, some manufacturers that aren't following best practices. And so the CDC actually has on their website a list of KN94 manufacturers that are uh, approved in terms of the quality of the masks that they're, they're making. So you can find the manufacturer and then you can go on and purchase it from Amazon or your local store. Um, but it really comes down to, uh, to, like Dr. Cotton said, a combination of what you can tolerate um, and in wearing um, for however long period you need to wear the mask um, and, and using a layered approach, masking on top of hand hygiene, on top of social distancing, on top of vaccinations and heavy shell. So it really, um, the more protections you incorporate, the, the better protected you'll be in the long run. Thank you, Brian. Um, let's see what we have. There are, Neil, I've seen a few, oh. Go, go for ahead. it. I've, I've seen a few questions just asking, maybe you can reiterate the timing of Evusheld around um, vaccine, meaning making sure there's some time spaced out so that we don't impair antibody formation or don't impair vaccine efficacy. Actually, so we think that actually there's no real interaction between Evusheld and the vaccine, but under the emergency use authorization, you aren't supposed to get um, Evusheld for two weeks after vaccine. So once you get a vaccine, like I saw somebody in clinic today, they'd gotten a vaccine 13 days ago and I wanted to give them Evusheld, but they were within that 14 days, so I didn't give it. So that's the only, only um, issue is that it's part of the emergency use authorization, so we're not supposed to violate that, but we don't actually think that like antibody binds vaccine or anything bad happens. I've talked to a bunch of immunologists about that, and I've talked to people at the CDC, FDA, and NIH about that, and we're not so worried about it. It's just no antibody for two weeks after a dose of vaccine. And then I'm seeing a lot of questions still about um, or hearing about far commercial pharmacies denying uh, booster vaccines. And honestly, um, you know, for all of us, it's been really hard to stay up to date during the pandemic. And I think some pharmacists um, struggle as well. And in a perfect world, everybody would know everything all the time. But um, I think it's, you know, you can show them the CDC guidelines that you do need two boosters if you're immunocompromised. So sorry that that's a problem. I have spoken with the CDC frequently and their community, they actually have a communications group that works with pharmacies, but I think it's hard to keep everybody up to date all the time with such a moving target. So we apologize if you're having trouble with that. We do have vaccine available in many of our clinics and pharmacy here. So if it's a real problem, um, we can help. Camille, can I bring this question about dining indoors? Uh uh, versus outdoors and you know, what is true the risk of, uh, of, of the indoor dining. I know now with the summer, maybe that's less of importance, but I know it's something that always comes up in clinic. Yeah. Well, the problem is you can mask, right? Like you can go to the movies and wear, a, you know, a, a really good mask. You can do so many things, but you need to take off your mask to eat, or at least it's very, very hard. Um, so I personally, uh, you know, there is significant risk of transmission, especially if you're sitting in a crowded restaurant with people around you. This isn't, you know, the virus is in the air. If people are at the table next to you or people that you're sitting with, it's there, it's in the air. Um, I'm not doing any indoor dining um, because of that, because I don't want to get sick because I'm taking care of all of you. Um, so uh, we don't eat indoors and outdoors because of wind flow and wind, you know, movement. Um, we really think that it's much, much safer. So I, I hope that answers the question. I know it's kind of a sad state of affairs and a, we'd love to say it's safe, but it's really, that's not, that's not safe at this point. I think we should all take full advantage of summertime. And, you know, there's so many places that have outdoor dining, um, they're on your apps where you make dinner reservations. You can put like, show me the outdoor options. Um, there's so many good options. You can go to a picnic bench, you can go to a park, like you can do so many things. And I know that sometimes you're the only one doing it because I'm there with you actually. I said, I made my kids sit outside for dinner on Saturday night and everybody else was indoor inside the restaurant, but we had a nice time. How many of the rest of you are eating, eating outdoors still on the, the clinicians on this call? I tend to, yeah, if we can't sit outside, of course. 
yeah but i mean you're sitting yeah you're sitting it's fine what's the next quote oh now how do you want to pick <laughs> I uploaded mine, Nahal, if you're looking. Um, I, I was gonna ask Camille, um, it seems like there've been a number in terms of having COVID and if that should weigh into timing of vaccination, you know, when you should be going for additional boosters or additional vaccines based on when you've, when you've had it, if that should delay any of the time. So for people who haven't had an organ transplant, we do recommend now, there's a new guidance that we recommend um, waiting three months after infection before getting boosters but we don't know that to be true for transplant patients. So I'm seeing so many transplant patients who are not up to date. They haven't had the full either four if they had J&J &J or five if they had all Pfizer or Moderna. They haven't had all their vaccines and they're coming in with infection. So, um, and they, people can get reinfected pretty quickly afterwards. There was news in the past couple of weeks that people can get infected four or five times a year. And that's probably true for transplant patients. So I don't think we should wait that full three months after infection to get another dose of vaccine, especially if people haven't had the full, full set of vaccines. So I think it should be shorter than that. I've seen a few questions come through on Going back to Evisheld, um, whether they should be getting patients should be getting the Evisheld from their transplant teams, or whether they should be requesting that from their primary care provider, and also just about the capacity of MGH to provide Evisheld to the transplant patients. And just wondered if someone wanted to take that and comment on on those issues. I started in the text, so apologize if this is sort of some some of it's um, a little doubled. But I think the the first part of that answer is probably that it's somewhat um, in some cases, a little bit organ specific based on our clinics, um, and then also some geographic preference based on patients and where you're living. So if you have a close relationship with primary care, if it's easy to get, um, by all means, I think it should be what's most convenient. Um, we can rely on the abdominal side. There's a day a week that we're doing Abby Sheldon Clinic. And so if you're contacting us and able to come and that's convenient, I think that's a great option. Um, but then there's gonna be flexibility, I think, with other aspects. And, and Brian and Greg, I welcome kind of input from you and sort of the, the heart and lung side, but, or Leo as well on more of the kidney, but abdominal sort of focus together there at CRP. Yeah, from the kidney side, I'll add, you know, one of the, the caveats about the injection with Ibushout is that you have to monitor the patient for one hour. So what ended up happening is that logistically, it's very hard with all the clinics running to, to have many extra spots for patients to get the able show. So we're encouraging patients, you know, that if we're not able to schedule soon uh, in the transplant clinic uh, to get uh, either through their PCP or, or uh, through uh, uh, a state uh, program called Gotham. So these are, there are a couple of different ways of you know, trying to, to get the Evo shell, then maybe Dr. Lewis uh, can also comment on the on the heart side. Thanks, I'll echo exactly what Leo said, that with the monitoring that's necessary within the cardiology clinic, you know, we are uh, pretty packed from the time that we start to the time that the clinic ends with our post-transplant care of patients. So we would like very much to have all of our heart transplant patients receive Evisheld. Uh, but we want you to take the path of least resistance, somewhat analogous to how you have with the vaccine administration at your local pharmacies. Uh, the, the, um, any way that you can get it, whether it be through Gotham or through the PCP's office, uh, is, is great. We have tried to really kind of bend over backwards to get Evisheld up to our clinic. It usually involves having our nurse practitioners go and get it from the pharmacy, bring it up to clinic, but then we have to observe you for an hour in clinic when oftentimes the cath lab is waiting to do the Radar cath and biopsy and so on and so forth. So, um, the uh, we encourage the Evisheld through the path of least resistance. Thank you. And I, I would add the. Sorry, Camille. I, I really, really recommend Gotham's. They are so incredibly organized, and uh, they do injections on Monday. Nobody's been in clinic on Sunday. It's widespread throughout the state of Massachusetts and they just do a phenomenally great job. They book within an hour of when I send in the form. And, and back to the point of the, the convenience as Camille was talking about, they're all over the state and it's probably a lot easier for you to go there than be coming to our clinics. We're glad to have you. If 
patients are being seen in clinic, uh, we are uh, recommending it as Emily and Leo has mentioned and everybody that we're, we wanna give it to you, but we wanna make it easy as well. To add an hour of waiting sometimes for your clinic visit is not ideal. And that's where we wanna facilitate this as much as possible. Another point I saw a few questions on, and I think Camille had mentioned this earlier about having a second Evi shell. We do not have recommendation from CDC to do that yet. No, it's okay. not approved. We definitely can't do that. It's it's it would be a violation of federal policy because it would violate the emergency use authorization. So definitely not. Um, so there will be messaging that comes out at some point in the next few months, but we we're waiting to hear more. Um, so for now, it would be great. Please don't ask us for more doses because you're asking us to violate federal policy, which um, we try really hard not to do. Camille, there's a question that I think is relevant about how, how transplanted patients are doing when they get infected with COVID now compared to you know, what was before. It's so much better. It is so much better. Um, fortunately, uh, I have not seen um, really sick patients like we were seeing either in the beginning or during Omicron in December and January. I mean, we have much better uh, vaccine, you know, vaccine rollout has been good. The multiple doses is good. People are generally, we, I was so happy to see how many people have had at least four doses of vaccine. That's wonderful. Hopefully people are heading into their fifth dose um, unless they had J and J like that's wonderful news. And that is really a game changer. And then we have monoclonal antibodies for treatment as I mentioned and the antivirals remdesivir Paxlovid for some, um, not most transplant patients though because of the drug interaction. So it's really been great that things have gotten so much better, um, but I'm still worried. And I, one thing I really wanna say is I know how hard it is for people to still feel that specter of disease out there. And um, it's been a really hard, long ride. It's been a hard, hard for us in, in the medical world. And then I know, and I, I'm on the CDC vaccine committee and at every meeting, I say something about immunocompromised patients and how we have to make sure we do everything we can to protect them. Um, so I am trying really, really hard um, to provide better protection knowing, knowing what a tough time it is. But luckily we've, we've had a much better experience in, in recent times. Um, Dr. Lewis actually put together the heart data that was looking, um, things had, improved in recent in recent times. So that's really optimistic. Yeah, I'll just comment. Our, our obviously sincere hope and feeling of obligation is to try to do everything possible to help you with preventing the development of COVID. We have been tracking uh, our data over time in terms of the heart transplant recipients who've gotten COVID. And I think just a message to you know any of you who have had the infection or, or may develop it, uh, early on in the pandemic, it was, you know, we saw a lot of severe respiratory compromise from it, need for ventilator support and so forth. And uh, during the year of 2022, um, we're seeing significantly less than 10% of our patients are being uh, requiring hospital admission, which is largely a testament, I think, to the rates of vaccination, the availability of the monoclonal antibodies uh, for treatment. Um, and so, you know, over 90% of our patients now are stay, are at home and getting through the, the course of the infection. Uh, but obviously we wanna still do everything possible to help you with prevention of getting it in the first place. To follow up to that, Greg, I saw um, a two-part question. Uh, the first one asked if getting Evyshield was going to limit in any way um, your ability to get treatment for COVID? And the answer for that is no. You know, if you get Evusheld and then contract COVID, you're still eligible for any of the, the therapies. The second part of the question, um, Camille, maybe I will sort of ask you on this. Um, if someone is now looking to catch up on vaccines, listening and they're at their second or their third and they need two more, should they wait to go through both of those before getting Evusheld? No, I would recommend. So I always pick, if you're at a point where you need something, I would always go with vaccine. Two weeks later, I'd get Evusheld and then wait either the, the appropriate number of months to get the next dose. But I would try to get Evusheld. I, 
I'm not a betting woman, but I suspect that Evusheld isn't going to be effective forever. Um, I think that with the new variants, so basically this virus is so smart, it figures out how to escape um, immune protection. And I think that Evusheld may not be effective like this summer, this fall. So I would personally try to get, try to get as much protection now um, and maybe people can relax a little knowing that they're really well protected. But then um, if BA4 and BA5 do come around, people really need to have excellent vaccine protection because that's really what's going to help prevent disease. W one thing I'm seeing is that over 80% of the people I'm seeing in the hospital are not fully vaccinated, are not up to date on their vaccines. And I just can't encourage that enough. And that's actually really the reason that we're having this meeting tonight is just to fully, fully, fully um, encourage people to get as many, uh, to be up to date on their vaccines. If you have questions or you're not sure, reach out. We're happy to you know, answer questions. Um, there was that great gateway um, message that came out with that really nice yellow, um, yellow and orange figure. So we really wanna make sure people are um, up to date on vaccines. So somebody's talking about flying to an event. Um, so somebody's talking about flying to an event. So I'm not I'm not afraid of the airplane because I would always mask on an airplane. I would I wear my family we fly we wear good masks. And then at parties, so indoor parties, um, you know I think people need to decide if it's worth the risk. But there are very high rates of disease transmission. You know we're seeing like. At some events, sometimes 10, 20, 30, 40% of a party will get infected. So we are still seeing these super spreader events. So I would be very cautious about parties and travel. Um, and I would try really hard to be outdoors. Somebody's asking how many antibodies have you shelled gives. Um, it's a really high dose of antibody. Um, and it sort of degrades over over the next several months. Um, somebody's asking when we're going to hear more about Evusheld, and hopefully it will be in the near future. But I don't have I'm not privy to what the FDA is going to be saying. Um, somebody else is asking about avoiding unvaccinated um, people. You know, um, we do think that unvaccinated people are more likely to have higher virus in their airways when they're infected. So they're probably higher risk to be around. Um, but if you, I would not be around, I would not be unmasked around. I sort of trust, I kind of say trust no one because we, we are seeing such high rates of disease. Greg, there was a question here uh, uh, in terms of the, the Evusheld again. If you have a history of heart disease, should you be more concerned about getting Evusheld, maybe just to reinforce that? Yeah, again, I think there was this early signal with a single myocardial infarction, which I think obviously can happen at any time. And so because of that in proximity to when the vaccine was given, that uh, you know raised the signal of concern with the Evisheld, but fortunately, with the very large trial of you know over three thousand people getting Evisheld, uh, it was a single event. So it is something that we've discussed with our you know patients that have had such severe heart disease that they've required a heart transplant in the past. Fortunately, uh, among many of our heart transplant recipients, their hearts are working very well. And so, uh, you know, if we look at the overall you know concerns about potential risk to the heart related to COVID itself. Uh, we think that the likelihood of cardiac complications from the Evisheld uh, appear to be very low uh, now that we are getting more experience with it. Um, Camille can certainly weigh in on, on her thoughts. I know that there was a, a lot of discussion about this when the Evisheld was first coming out in terms of what we should do with patients that have a history of cardiac mm. uh, disease, but the incidence rates have proven to be very, very low. Yeah, I'm really not worried. I actually worry more about people getting COVID infection and then having cardiac stress in that situation. So 
if I were a transplant patient and had a history of heart disease, I would actually definitely get a V-shelled. That's, that's my personal two cents of how I've interpreted that. And I've spoken with a lot of experts. So yeah, thanks, Craig. Dr. Cotton, you, you sorry, I, I've been typing a few answers, but I, I may have missed, but have you spoken about uh, mix, mixing uh, vaccines at all? Oh. And if, if there's any benefit of that or and uh, what's the data there? I love that question. I love that question. So that's like the mix and match approach. So should you get all Moderna or should you get all Pfizer? And over 95% of Americans get all matching vaccines. But it actually looks like maybe, maybe there's some benefit to sort of um, alternating the vaccines you get. So I personally had three Moderna and um, I just got a Pfizer. Uh, and that's called the, the mix and match approach. Um, one thing for transplant patients is it does look like Moderna uh, results in higher antibody levels. And then it looks, um, when we do the boosters with Moderna, they're actually half dose. So when we do boosters with Pfizer, it's still full, um, full dose. So you might want to go with, what I've sort of recommended is Pfizer for the first three and then following up with, I'm sorry, Moderna for the first three and following up with Pfizer booster because it's the full dose. But, you know, Leo, at the end of the day, I don't know that it really matters. The most important thing is to try to get five vaccines in unless you had J&J, &J, at which point it's four. That's the most important thing. And it's interesting. Many people are very committed to the type of vaccine they started with, but um, both my husband and I did a mix and match approach. Maybe it's a personality thing. <laughs> awesome. We're Thank getting you. close. We're getting close to the top of the hour. Maybe um, Brian and Greg, Emily Nahal, what would you like? What what messages would you like to tell people at this point? Yeah, I, I can start. Um, well, I think there's there's one comment that's kind of come up a couple of times that I, I wanted to talk because I think it's important and it has to do with um, family members and whether precautions that we're recommending for transplant patients should apply to close contacts, family members, kids and things. And I would say I, I do think it's important because we know that the majority of our patients get infected from close contacts, um, whether that's um, kids who bring it home from school or a significant other who is out in the community and then brings it brings it home. Um, but it does seem that a lot of the infection in transplant patients comes transmitted from, from a family member. So um, encouraging family members to take the same precautions, um, masking, vaccination. Um, obviously, Evusheld may not be uh, on the table for them because there are um, stricter guidelines on who can receive that. But the other things, vaccinations, hand washing, masking, are all very important for, for family members too. Dr. Lewis? Sure. So I, I think I'll reiterate what was said before, because I think we've, we've seen from the chat and from the questions that there are many of you on the call that are really doing everything you possibly can uh, to to prevent the infection from coming on, whether it be the five vaccinations, the Evasheld, and we want to applaud those efforts uh, and also, you know, send some signal of of hopefulness, just in that we are seeing a much more mild uh, face of COVID right now for those of you who do end up getting it, despite all of your best efforts, um, which has been encouraging for us to see. You know, our hospital was overrun with patients both immunocompromised and not immunocompromised that were on ventilators here at MGH. And we're not seeing that anymore. You know, there's been times that our ICU has been free of patients with COVID, including free of transplant patients with COVID. Uh, so I do think we're in a better place right now, uh, thanks to all the efforts around the vaccines and the protective antibodies and the ability to respond to COVID uh, with monoclonal antibody treatment. So I just want to send some, some message of optimism because it's been a really long haul uh, for, for all of you that are on this call and we recognize that. Dr. Elias. So I want to <clears throat> I want to echo what was said and I would add this optimism that Greg has spoke about really comes from tremendous efforts by everybody within the transplant center. We care about every patient of ours 
and as you see here, it takes a village, and it takes a village of very smart individuals who are taking care of you everywhere. And another piece of that is really encouraging you to get your shots, get vaccinated, and get supported so you are able to go through this. And for those who get it, and some people will be getting it, we are we have great therapies and we are able to support you. So uh, I want to thank you all for participating and definitely thank all the panelists for tremendous work from every side. Dr. Bitte. Yeah, I will. I, I know we're um, coming up on time. I think everyone else has said it very, uh, very well. It's um, I do think optimism is hopefully one of the primary messages. I think a lot of you have been waiting a long time and isolating a long time and have family who have been doing it along with you. Um, there are still going to be more news, more things that sort of come up. We will work to keep you informed. Um, thank you for continuing to keep in touch with us. Um, and then hopefully we'll be able to provide ongoing encouraging news in the upcoming months. But keep getting those vaccines. We'll have more, I'm sure, in the way of those recommendations and Evie Shield recommendations, um, maybe even in the short term. So Yeah. And I think it has been a learning curve, I think, for all of us. And, and that's an important part that, you know, the, the virus was new. There were things that changed. And some of the recommendations change, and, and sometimes it can be frustrating, I think, to, to all of us to keep updated. But but it's really you know science advancing and us learning as as uh, new data comes comes out, and we're always going to try to keep uh, you guys updated about what's the latest, and of course doing our own research at Mass General, so we can also push uh, push the boundaries here. Dr. Cotton, last comments, please. Uh, Thank you so much. Well, it's great to see all these questions in the chat. People are asking really high level questions. I know that everybody who's coming to the call is really interested in helping protect yourselves and um, your loved ones. And then um, I think it's been amazing. We've done this as a community. The whole pandemic, um, all my colleagues on this call, we've come together and made sure that we did things that were as safe and effective. And we kept transplant going. Our transplant numbers are going gangbusters, which is great even um, during this challenging few years. Um, so we appreciate the community work. Um, and we know that this is a hard time to be immunocompromised. I am optimistic for the future. Things are getting better all the time. Um, and so we hope that you all have a really wonderful summer, lots of time outdoors, wear your um, bug spray and your um, suntan lotion, but have a great time seeing friends. Everyone should um, reboot because it was a bit of a long, a long winter for many of us, um, but good, good luck. And we hope that this was educational and helpful for all of you. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, just so you know, there will be a survey at the end of this. Um, please fill it out. Let us know how we did, what else you'd like to see. And um, we will definitely get this recorded um, version out to you all by next week. Um, again, thank you for joining and have a good night.